Welcome, Omar. Hey, there you go. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the State of Our Faith. This is Mother's Day, and we're grateful that we get to gather again for this fruitful conversation that we've been having all during this time of the coronavirus. Uh, it has created all sorts of new social uh, relationships, uh, ways of navigating our time and adjusting. And it seems that um, the adjustments even pertain to our relationships between men and women and how uh, we are struggling with uh, the role relationships of genders as well. Um, not sure whether we are on yet. Uh, can someone confirm to me that we are on? Yeah, we're on. We're on. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, technology is another one of those adjustments, isn't it? I'm uh, delighted that uh, Imam Omar Solomon is with us again this week, as well as Rabbi Nancy Kasten. Uh, we're going to turn first to Nancy uh, because it seems only fitting that we begin this uh, Mother's Day conversation with her. But just to frame this a little bit more, uh, this is a, both a day of great blessing and also to some degree for many people, a day of sadness and conflicting feelings. Uh, some who are not mothers, but wish they were. Some who are mothers and who struggle in their relationship with their children. Uh, some who struggle with their relationship with their mother or they have lost a mother in recent times. Uh, there, there are all sorts of ways in which this day is filled with uh, both uh, blessing and sadness uh, for people, but also uh, how it is deepening uh, our reflection because we are so close to one another in uh, this time of social isolation uh, in our households, how it's teaching us uh, to rethink how we just relate to one another, husbands and wives, for instance, and children to parents. Nancy, what is this Mother's Day like for you? Uh, what are your reflections on it? Uh, and both personally, and I think uh, in terms of what you, how you reflect upon it in your faith tradition. Well, it's been an interesting time for me um, to think about um, the, about how motherhood impacts my own identity as a human being, as a person. And, you know, I had been an empty nester, what, what they call an empty nester, I don't really love that term, but for a year and a half prior to this COVID outbreak. And so um, we have three adult or almost adult children. Our youngest is in college and um, we, we didn't really think that we were going to have kids at home anymore for any extended time. And now we find ourselves with two of our three adult children living here at home and with um, David working at home, as I always do. And um, so now we're thrust back into this um, situation that we didn't really think that we were going to face again. And last year, after a year of living just with David and me, for the most part, without kids, I had been thinking a lot about the things that I do at home that I started doing when I became a mother and ended up doing by myself as a mother and whether those are things that I still had to do now that we didn't have kids at home. And for our anniversary last year, I actually gave David this book um, by Darcy Lockman called All the Rage, which sat on his shelf for several months. And finally, when he read it, um, he started to understand, at least intellectually, this idea of the mental load that mothers take on. And um, it's so now, having been placed in a situation where I'm actively mothering again in a certain way, although it's very different for adult children, it's really caused me to think about what it means to be a mother versus what it means to be a human being. And I think about the faith aspect of it, you know, as I think about it, all the qualities that we associate with um, motherhood, the, the positive qualities, the nurturing, the self-sacrifice, the forgiveness, the um, unconditional love, 
those are all aspects of God, God's um, personality. In fact, the one time in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, where God describes God's self, God says, I am the God of Rach, uh, El Rachum Vachanun, God of compassion and God of grace. And Rachum is from the Hebrew word that means womb, Rechem, womb. And so God's, um, God is able to incorporate all of the attributes that we associate with mothers and of fathers, and we allow God to have those attributes, yet we assign um, specific attributes to mothers and fathers in our culture and in most cultures. And I think that um, today I'm looking forward to talking about the distinction between uh, biology to begin with and evolution and then faith and how um, theology impacts our understanding of our, um, our roles that we play and then how culture and habits then mm -hmm. form around those ideas and, be and belief systems. I think it was really interesting as I was listening to you you might have noticed the big smile come on my face because you kind of took a talking point for me, uh, but, it, but, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it's, but it's, it just blew my mind because what is, what is it that Muslims say when they begin anything? Bismillah, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, in the name of God, the most compassionate, ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, the most merciful. And, uh, and what, what we talk about, see in Islam, God has um, 99 names one God, 99 names, and those 99 names are to give you a broader perspective of God so that you supplicate to him, understanding the various elements and layers of those names and attributes. And uh, Rahman, Rahim, uh, the word Rahim, which means womb in Arabic, comes from uh, Rahman, Rahim. And so we always make that connection in our teachings uh, between the way that the mother loves and, and shows a, you know, a great deal of mercy uh, to her child, the way that God loves us and shows a great deal of mercy to us. And in fact, the tradition that often comes, and there are a few of them, and I think I'll, I'll transition probably with this into probably something that's been on my mind in regards to this, uh, just with the current context. Uh, one of them was, um, you know, a, a woman that was running through uh, a battlefield, uh, it completely ignoring all the swords and everything that was around her. And she was completely distressed. And she was not paying attention to anything around her um, and you know everyone was captivated by her emotion and then she grabbed her baby she found her baby and she grabbed her baby and she held her baby tight and uh, all of the companions of the prophet muhammad peace be upon him were completely captivated by that sight of that woman that grabbed her baby and held her baby tight like that and uh, he said do you think that that woman would ever throw her her baby into a fire and they said, no, he said, God, bika. God loves you more than that woman loves her child to use that example, to captivate that, that moment. And what I'm thinking about, um, you know, at the moment, I think is Ahmad Ar Arbery and the mother Wanda Cooper of Ahmad Arbery. And, and, you know, what we experienced very close up here with the mother of Botham John, um, you know, who, who was just, who became such a face of, the mothers uh, against police brutality, not in the organizational sense, a wonderful organization, but a, a mother who had lost her child and then actually brought out other mothers who had lost their children to police brutality that had not been paid attention to. And the great pain that they experienced because of that uh, connection that God puts between the mother and the child that is unlike any other connection. And um, I gave a sermon that week about another incident in Islam where the prophet and his companions were on a journey and they saw, um, you know, they saw a, a, a bird that was clearly distressed over them. And the words of the prophet Muhammad, he said, who caused this one, who caused this one great distress with her children? And, you know, what, what I started off the sermon with, and that was in the wake of seeing the mother of Botham John and how she showed that great pain here was, if I was to just take that statement, who has distressed this one with her child? And I didn't mention that it was a bird. Uh, you know, you would take that as a very powerful sentiment to be attributed to a human being, but he was talking about a bird that was complaining to him about one of the companions on that journey who had taken her children from the nest 
and was complaining, was hovering in stress. And I said, you know, that's what I thought of when I saw the mother of Botham John, who has distressed this one in regards to her child, who has put her through that great pain? Because when a child is taken unjustly, um, I can't imagine, I'm not a mother, <laughs> you know, I, I can't imagine um, the pain. I can only see the transfer of that pain uh, through what God has given us of access through the eyes and the heart. I can't imagine the pain that that causes to a person. And when they demand justice for their children, uh, as they're killed unjustly, then it behooves us to, 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 I think it's important for us to take a moment to say this journey for them is going to be so much different than the journey for anyone else, a mother whose child has been taken unjustly. And uh, that's who I'm thinking about. And that's who's on my mind right now. And um, I think that you start from that place and then obviously it transitions into a broader place of just the role uh, that, the, that, you know, uh, the, the virtue of the mother in, in, in Islam. Um, it's the highest level of virtue and it is attributed, you know, God says that he has um, commanded you to worship none but him and to show excellence to your parents. And then he mentions some of the specific virtues of the mother. Uh, and, you know, what, what I think is important for us to take is to remove, obviously, you know, the, the stereotypes and remove some of the things and some of the undue burdens we put on mothers. And then to think about how we honor mothers, both in understanding their, the unique pain that mothers must feel, but also the undue burdens we sometimes place on them. You know, in, in Christianity, we have uh, a tradition of honoring uh, the Blessed Virgin, the mother of Jesus, uh, in a special way, and that is shared in Islam uh, by the reverence uh, for Mary as well. Uh, but it, the, the, the tendency for some is to elevate her primarily because she is the mother of Jesus. Uh, and, and, and there's something to that, of course, that we can recognize and see her as a symbol, therefore, of God's union with the world and the hospitality of uh, the womb and her willingness to be uh, used by God in, in this way to give birth to uh, uh, the, the, the sense of new creation that God is bringing to pass. Uh, but if we leave her only in the role of mother, uh, that becomes a gender stereotype that actually even Jesus himself began to undermine during his own time. There's a story in the Gospel of Luke where a woman comes up to Jesus and says, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. And Jesus said, no, blessed even more are those women who hear the word of God and obey it. That is to say, Jesus is moving uh, people's attention from the gender stereotype of, the, of, of women being simply blessed because of their maternal character and seeing them instead as equal partners in doing the work of God in the world, in being uh, uh, agents of God in, uh, in all things, not simply in the bearing and nurturing of children. Uh, which has become something that is more limiting, even if it is noble work. So uh, this is my question then, you know, we have from all of our faith traditions, we have examples of, um, you know, women being revered and uh, acknowledged for their, um, their worth and their qualities and all of that. And then we get to our world where we live and women um, are really, discounted in so many ways. And, and let's just bring it home because I'll tell you that now I'm living with three adults and they're all capable of being, all of them are old enough to be parents themselves, but they're only one of them is. And I can tell you that um, the responsibilities for things like meals and house cleaning and um, basic, you know, things, everyday tasks that create an environment, a home, a loving and nurturing place, world for us here in our little house. Well, it's not so little, but you know, during this epidemic, this pandemic, you know, everybody's doing their work. You know, either studying or you know their meetings or their 
you know, worship online or whatever. Um, and I'm doing my work too, but somehow I also am thinking about what's in the refrigerator and um, whether the toilets need to be clean and uh, that the light bulbs went out and that the bills haven't been paid. But those are not things that are, you know, a reflection of my elevated status as a woman. Right. Or oh, any, you're very Proverbs 31 of you, Nancy. You yes. Know, I didn't learn how to do that by going to college or graduate right. school. I just learned it by watching who was doing it and who was doing it were the other women. And I have to say my family's been pretty good and we've worked on this a lot over the last few weeks, but I'm amazed at how many friends I talk to whose families are not doing anything to um, assist with that uh, everyday caring for nurturing the essential essential work literally essential work so how do we get from our faith traditions and their messaging to here yes i mean the way that 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 you know we sort of function with this uh and khadija just gave a little scream in the background like you better tell the truth about <laughs> <laughs> not a very good one year old yeah yeah yes <laughs> daughter <laughs> yeah, my love, my, my eleven month old daughter turning one very soon. So she's 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 made sure to to let everyone know that she's not happy with quarantining with the Zoom calls. Uh, uh, but you know she's um, I should I guess when we're talking about you know how we deal with this from from the from the Islamic tradition. I think I really liked what what George had mentioned, uh, noble work, but but not limiting to that. And uh, I don't want to. I, I don't want to pivot back to that, but I think it would help me sort of put together, like with Mary. Mary, uh, peace be upon her, is the highest woman in Islam. She's considered the the chosen woman of all time. There's a whole chapter in the Quran named after her, and she's actually mentioned by name in the Quran more than Jesus, peace be upon him. Meaning her name is mentioned alone um, multiple times. That could explain like the the the, the disproportionate. Um, you know, rate of, of uh, Catholic women converts to Islam. You know? Yeah, right. uh, but but there's a, there's a great reverence for Mary, and one of the things that God makes it a point to mention is uh, in the Quran uh, that she's in the league of her own because of her worship, and certainly being the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him, is noble, and that that definitely is a part of nobility. But her worship just just puts her her worship as an example for all of us. Uh, with that being said, I think coming back to our time, and I, I'm sorry to pivot back to that. Um, you know, one of the descriptions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is uh, when he would come home, kana fi khidmati ahlihi, which means he was in the service of the people of his home. And so typically the way we put off um, whoever it is, man or woman, uh, whatever age, whoever's working outside of the home, quote unquote, and, you know, and, and you know, that's, that's making the assumption that only one person is, which is not the case anymore in, in most situations, whoever it is that's sort of out there doing what that when they come home, it's, I'm going to collapse and, and just be serve um, and not do anything. And so that kind of flipped that because when he came home, he brought the same spirit of service outside the home into the home. And then, you know, she mentioned uh, repairing his own shoes, uh, you know, putting together his own meals, serving those in his family. Now, in, in Islam, it's it's the way that we look at, it, and I think it's important for us, probably as as people of faith in general, uh, to assign nobility to the work of service and to say that service in the household is the greatest form of service, and that is a reward that's available to all of us, and that all of us should partake and participate, and not not overburden uh, one person in the household, which typically would be um, the mother. Uh, but but to try to reduce that workload and to spread it to see great virtue in that to say that everyone you know not just uh, you know uh, place this this great burden on one person but take part in this great reward of doing the things at home that aren't often seen by people on the outside and there's a there's a social element a psychological element but the spiritual element of that from my from my place is hey you know. Uh, I, you know, if, if I, if I change a diaper, there's, there's virtue in that, <laughs> you know, and I can, that's a reward. Uh, you know, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him said, there's no greater charity than the morsel of food that you put in the mouth uh, of your, of your loved ones. And so it's bringing it back home and saying, let's stop, you know, taking sort of the noble place that God has put the mother in Islam and then saying, well, don't you want to keep that place? So let's just keep on pushing tasks your way. It's no, let's, especially under quarantine, 
uh, we all have to adjust and it's not fair to ask one person not to adjust um, and just to, to add to the workload and then everybody else just kind of stay in your place and keep doing what you're doing. We all have to adjust and take that on. But we have this attitude that those things are voluntary and that, you know, if, um, if they don't get done, well, it's okay. But I think part of what we've learned from the pandemic and being at home is that you can, you can only, that only lasts so long, right? Ultimately, you find that those are things that are required of any human being. And so when you play that out and think about how those roles are filled, not just at home, but the caring, nurturing, feeding, um, you know, sustenance kinds of roles that are played in our society, the, the nurses, the teachers, the home health aides, the you know, grocery store workers, all of those, why are those things not valued to mm. the extent that, you know? So I, I wanna explore a little bit the, the role religion plays also in either reinforcing gender stereotypes or challenging them. Uh, and Christianity has a, a, a mixed history about this because even today, we have those who see our faith, it, it, our Christian faith, as reinforcing gender roles, gender types, and all the duties that go with uh, what being a woman is and what being a man is. And then those who have a faith perspective of Christianity that sees uh, our faith as actually undermining those or reinventing them for the coming reign of God and the way we're going to live together when God's will is finally done on earth as it is in heaven. And th there's, a, there's a verse from the book of Galatians where uh, the apostle says that in Christ, there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male and female, all are one in Christ Jesus, he says. Now that oneness doesn't of course obliterate gender uh, altogether, nor uh, social standing, nor uh, ethnic origins, uh, things of that nature. But the question is, how will you define who you are? And it begins, uh, Paul is saying, uh, by your spiritual identity, which is not dependent upon these social distinctions or biological distinctions, uh, that those are incidental to your ultimate identity. Now, if that is so, then some Christians get around that by saying, yes, men and women are equal in essence, but they are eternally different in roles. Uh, others and I fall into this category, believe that the roles themselves are more biologically necessary. You can bear children and I can't, Nancy, you know, obviously. And so there's a certain necessity to that. But when the, that gets extended to patriarchy and to male superiority in some way, that's what has to be undermined toward the vision of a more equal and just sharing of life uh, between equal partners. So Christianity has a mixed history of whether it is reinforcing a kind of limited role for women defined uh, and, and sometimes even oppressive, or a more liberative role where there is a genuine sharing and mutuality uh, that we are all uh, learning to live into that is God's will and God's call to us. I mean, those two choices are right in, you know, the two accounts of creation, right? We have yes. one account mm -hmm. that could be interpreted as um, male superiority over female and female mm -hmm. being only one tiny aspect of, or a f reflection of, of male versus a, an image of male and female that are completely intertwined, interdependent, mm -hmm. um, and I sometimes wonder, actually, if our culture and society um, had allowed for it and allowed people to really be who they are supposed to be in that, you know, godly vision, whether we would see people feeling the need to 
have sex change operations or, you know, change their gender formally. If, if people were accepted for who they were and weren't so um, limited by their, uh, their gender uh, associations, then maybe people could just be comfortable where they were without feeling like they needed to change something external to reflect their internal nature. Yeah, so, so um, I think that definitely, um, you know, within Islam, there is certainly a notion of, of, of gender roles and uh, this, this, it exists, you know, the, the distinction is drawn uh, through the text at least between, you know, uh, equality and salvation and then equality and work and workload, worship and work, uh, similar to, I think, George, what you would see in some, though I hate, you know, I think it's important especially when we, we have interfaith dialogue to not, uh, you know, uh, transimpose every inter uh, religious uh, or intrafaith uh, debate and make the same assumptions that it's the exact same thing within other right. faith traditions. Right. So in Islam, for example, uh, the debate would, you know, sort of accept certain fundamentals amongst most Muslims, but then the, the most frequently repeated word in the Quran when, when talking about marriage, when talking about compromise in the home is bil uh, ma'roof, which means according to custom. Uh, and it's very, it, it's intentionally ambiguous to be interpreted by the times and to take into account certain customs and cultures and not to let that. Now, the problem with that is that some people then take culture and then they turn that into religion to where they bring in elements of culture that are indeed oppressive and that, you know, that, that, that are hurtful and harmful. Um, and typically those things, and that's why if you think about gender, I think in, in general, when you look at the, the world today, there isn't going to be a radically different way that gender roles are dealt with in regions across religious distinctions, right? So if you took, if you took parts of the world and, you know, all three of us have traveled greatly, <laughs> If you were to go into, uh, you know, a household that belongs to one faith and another household in the same region, you're going to typically see the same understandings, if you will, and then a languaging is given to that. So I think that what mm -hmm. needs to be undermined are the negative elements of culture that then dominate sort of the, the the parts of our religion that call us to be more understanding and that call us to rise above and that call us to lift the burden off of one another and to support one another in our mission. Uh, of good, but then also to take in consideration custom, uh, and the word in Islam is, is ada, which is custom more so than culture. Custom means that it's not, it's just not reasonable to expect the same responsibilities from someone that lives in a society where people have these roles that are placed upon them by necessary uh, just just as, as, as a circumstance of the necessary functioning of that society and then to uh, not make any adjustments to certain things uh, in regards to the arrangements at home. So that's where custom, custom is typically brought up like in terms of what's, what's alimony? Uh, what does that look like in a society? It's not quantified. What are these, how do these things play out? Because what was required prior is not required now. So uh, I think we're called to a place of benevolence and we're called to uplift one another um, and I, you know, I, I think there's a lot to pause and think about what you just mentioned about people feeling, um, oppressed, uh, by religion, um, and, and by some of the things that are packaged as religion. I find that most of the frustrations people have with religious, uh, with religion in regards to who we are and how we're supposed to function are not actually the religion itself, but it's, a culture that they did not grow up in, especially in my community, by the way, we, you know, second generation, 50% uh, of the Muslim community in America, 50% uh, is, is, an, is an immigrant population. So we got the largest block uh, of our community, which is African American, and then you've got, you know, uh, Caucasian uh, Muslims and, and people of, of all types of backgrounds, 50% is immigrant, and then you've got a significant part of the, that are not in the 50% that are the children of immigrants. And you know, they're trying to grapple with religion, their parents' culture, and American culture, and figure out how Islam fits in all of that, uh, with just the, the, the due pressures that society puts on us. 
uh, in general and try to negotiate all of that in a way that they still feel good about their religion, but at the same time, they don't feel shackled by their religion. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot to unpack, um, you know, to deal with those two competing forces all the time in my community. Well, you know, David and I were talking about this this morning and the thought occurred to us, and this is something for more contemplation and another show because we're coming to the end of our time. But, you know, in some ways, religion has itself, the role that religion plays in our society has bifurcated into these sort of stereotypical male and female um, aspects. So you have one kind of religion that is very um you know, dominant and self-assured and write all, you know, knows what literalist and um, uh, and very fixed in its ways and habits. And you have another way that religion has played itself out with the things that we think about as more um, nurturing and kind. And, and, and when we in the public square mention things like, you know, basing um, public policy on religious principles like mercy and compassion and justice, we're told, oh, well, you know, again, that's voluntary. You know, when everything else is worked out by the, the men in the room, then we can, you know, we can deal with some of these women's issues, right? So in a way, even religion itself in the public square has defaulted into these male and female categories in a certain way to our detriment. <clears throat> And yet we also, probably as we wrap up today, need to think about the fact that um, it's, not just, it's not just immigrants who are experiencing this difference, uh, Omar. I think it's also generations that are experiencing this difference. So there are, there are many mothers of um, my mother's generation, say, for instance, who might be watching at this time saying, yeah, there are things that I chafed under uh, that were expected of me and wish that might have been different, but I chose to live within that environment and that culture. And it, it's in some ways, it's felt by that generation to be a judgment that they made wrong decisions about their lives because they, they lived the way they did in their time. And now younger folks are sort of rejecting those role relationships in the way they are. And, and I think we just need to have an awful lot of kindness and grace with one another as we're managing all of this and a, a lot less judgment, but a lot more in, encouragement to think afresh about it, to take personal responsibility uh, for how our relationships uh, should be as we go forward. Thank you for the fruitfulness of this discussion and uh, for all the things you've given us to think about today, especially Nancy, uh, as you've been bearing witness in your own uh, experience. Would you uh, close us with a prayer? I will, and I just, I'm bringing a poem. You know, a lot of times mothers are asked, you know, what do you want for Mother's Day, especially when you've been a mother for as long as I have, 27, this is my 28th Mother's Day. Um, as a mother, and every every year I reflect more on what I'm learning about my own mother and how appreciative she's been gone now for 10 years, but I appreciate more and more things about her. Um, I'm offering this poem by Billy Collins called The Lanyard, and in a way uh, it's, it is like a prayer. Um, love it. You know, uh, and I think you'll see why in a moment because what do we all really want um, from life and from our children? The other day, as I was ricocheting slowly off the pale blue walls of this room, bouncing from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, I found myself in the L section of the dictionary where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more suddenly into the past, a past where I sat at a workbench, at a camp, by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid this thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one, if that's what you did with them. But that did not keep me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. 
she gave me life and milk from her breasts, and I gave her a lanyard. She nursed me in many a sick room, lifted teaspoons of medicine to my lips, set cold face cloths on my forehead, and then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim. And I, in return, presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said, and here is clothing and a good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, bones and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the archaic truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-toned lanyard from my hands, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. And so it is with our prayers, and yet we keep offering them, and God accepts them. And so on this Mother's Day, we recognize that God and our mothers offer us so much more than we could ever give thanks for. And yet, in our inadequacy, in our need to show how humble we are, knowing that we are inadequate, we still continue to offer our lanyards and our prayers to you, dear God. Amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you.